Okay, Yosha, thanks for joining me on the AHI uh, video blog, which I'm starting to call it now. Uh, I'd like to start here with a little story that I think is relevant to you, and it's partly because you did a postdoc with Michael Jordan in cognitive science at MIT back in the 90s, and I had spent a lot of time there. And during this time period, there were um, uh, early, you know, four or five years before this, there was a thing called Net Talk, which you may recall. Yes, of course. And the uh, student, Charlie Rosenberg, was actually at Princeton, and I was one of his advisors. So this was like, oh, you know, I, he came back. Uh, from a summer vacation with Terry Sanaski and, and uh, George Miller was uh, his his uh, senior advisor and so uh, George and I sat down on a Sunday afternoon when when uh, he came back from Terry's and he played net talk for us <laughs> and I went that's what happened with my deck talk you took it <laughs> and you record he says no 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 this is this is a decoding from the from the one the one hidden layer network I said wow and George uh, very uh, uh, intuitively sat back and he says, wow, this is like a trap door, isn't it? Things go in and you don't know what's happening and you can't get them back out. <laughs> well, <laughs> it caught my attention. And another part of this was when I was uh, a program chair of, of NIPS, uh, Jan LeCun, who you also uh, worked with, <clears throat> showed up to the meeting and uh, he was program chair for what accounted for almost 50% of the submissions which was at that time called algorithms and architectures right, right. You, you may remember that from you were probably a reviewer or an area chair at, at some time as well uh, so I was, I was a general and program chair later Exactly. No, I know that. And and algorithms and architectures eventually disappeared. But here's a wonderful thing that Jan did. He showed up, and uh, we this was at Yale because John Moody was the general chair, and we're in computer science. We're sitting in big hallway, and he shows up, and everyone's been working. He's a little late, and he says, "I can't accept any papers here." And this was like fifty percent of the he rejected every paper. <laughs> And he just didn't like algorithms and architectures. He did. He thought that it it was neither theoretical nor was it applied. It was just kind of uh, people making crap up, and he didn't like it. You know, God bless him. But it, eventually, he you know came around, and we were able to accept about half of the things he rejected uh, through other people arguing with him. But what was interesting about that is just part of that. You know, NIPS was about neural uh, computation or neuroscience and cognitive science. In fact, those were the two largest uh, areas in the very beginning of the conference. By the fourth or fifth year, algorithms and architectures had taken over, and some applications, speech recognition, of course, was an obvious case that was uh, incredibly popular. And there were some very, Alex Weibel was doing just amazing things I, at that time. I was working on speech recognition during my PhD, I, actually. I imagine that might be the case. And it, 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 it turns out to be, obviously, uh, extremely interesting now as well. But the question that comes up, or the thing that uh, you know, I muse about when I, I think about uh, your research, and, and I think you're particularly unique in this regard in the way that you have essentially absorbed a lot of different kinds of uh, sort of scientific fields and then try to merge them together in some coherent whole. And part of this is actually your embrace of uh, cognitive science or cognitive psychology and uh, what you know, I know and love is memory systems. So one of the things we study in our lab is, in fact, implicit explicit memory, and we've been doing this since you know the late seventies. And uh, my my wife, who was a collaborator, Catherine Hans, and she did most of her thesis work on implicit explicit memories, and we published a lot of brain imaging uh, stuff in this area. One of the real confusions about this is that, you know, explicit memory is this declarative thing which probably is more linguistic based, has verbal structure to it, and the implicit thing is, you know, like when you make risotto, my favorite example, uh, you know, you put the risotto down, some olive oil, some garlic, and then somehow it gets made, and you go, what? How'd that happen? 
and you don't really go through a recipe. If you know what you're doing, if it actually works out, you don't have a recipe. You just do it. And this is part of the problem, right? Because a lot of what we're doing right now uh, is implicit uh, problem solving. It's not explicit. But it does beg the question, what's the, say, neuroscience or cognitive science connection between explicit and implicit systems? And I think this connects back to what you're calling deep learning 2.0. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's exactly spot on. Oh, perfect. Okay, well. So, yeah. What uh, do you think? I I, I think um, you may actually explain, and the fact that we haven't incorporated these notions from cognitive science and neuroscience in machine learning may actually explain a large part of the gap that we observe in the abilities of humans and machines, in particular when it comes to something that looks unrelated, and that is um, out of distribution generalization. So one of the big question marks in machine learning in the last few years is we want to be able to generalize not just on the training distribution, like a test set that comes from the same distribution as a right, training set, right, right, right. but we want to generalize to different distributions that somehow have to do with the same concepts, but it, you know they come up in a different way. Like, well, you think that's a human? Is that something that us humans deal with as a natural consequence of the, you know, the distributions in the world? Yeah, I mean, we have to. Like, if we, if we weren't able to do that, we, you know, evolution would have deleted those genes. <laughs> um, so you know, we have evolved a way to deal with those changes in the world. So let me give you an example, and you'll see the connection to higher level cognition and explicit memory and so on. Let's say you've been driving cars in North America only, and you know, most of your life, all your life, and then you go to London, you rent a car. Traffic law is almost the same, except for this little detail. So, you have to drive you're, on the, you're on the wrong right? side of the car. Yeah. Exactly. So now, what's going on, right? It's very interesting. What's going on is you can't just drive by your your habit. Otherwise, you're going to make an accident. Right. And you you know this. I mean, you know this. It, it's just you don't even need to think about it. But what what is actually happening is you you keep paying attention to what's going on on the road much in a different way than normal driving. Uh, and in particular, you keep in mind, oh, I have to drive on the left, I have to drive on the left, that everything is reversed. That, and that allows you to survive, right? So, so this ability to work with explicit memory, like this role that has changed, to uh, think about what you're doing before you're just acting on impulse, and maybe revise your impulse because you know, oh, I was going to do the usual thing and, and, and I would have had an accident. So, so that's that's an ability that allows us to um, transfer what we've learned about driving and just change the things that here verbally have been pointed out as different. So the distribution has changed. Well, yeah. so so humans are really good at that, and and we don't have anything like this in machine learning these days yet. Well, but, but let's, let's back up. Humans, uh, I don't think, are very good at this. <laughs> That's part well, of the problem. they're better than machines. They're yeah, better well, than well machines. they're better than machines and that machines don't do it at all, uh, really. Exactly. And, and, uh, but here's the thing. I mean, this touches on all kinds of uh, what I would call sort of third rails <laughs> in machine learning and AI and in cognitive science. And it has to do uh, with consciousness. For one exactly. thing, it has to do with conscious the awareness. Word. The C word, unfortunately, we won't say that. Uh, and then <laughs> um, the the idea of um, what's an explanation. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical. I mean, I've got a lot of uh, philosophy and linguistics friends where we do argue about, about this. what's an explanation for a couple of years now. Yes. And, and I think it's really important that machine learning tackles that because it has to do with abstraction. Right. So. Just as a context, the, the the deep motivation we had for deep learning in the early 2000s, at least the one that drove me, is the notion that we could learn these deep nets where at the top of the 
um, you know, top layers, we would have really abstract representations that capture the kind of abstract concepts that we manipulate to understand the world, um, including, uh, you know, the verbalizable stuff, the conscious stuff. So we haven't achieved that. And if we want to achieve that, and I think we need to, in order to approach human intelligence, we need to tackle this question of how do we come up with these abstract explanations? And we have a lot of clues because, of course, you know, that's the part that's uh, the tip of the iceberg that we can see through our, you know, inner, inner, uh, you know, observations of what's going on in our mind. And, and of course, cognitive science is trying to do this more, more formally, but by asking people about what they're thinking and whatever. Right, right. And so we have a lot of information, and now you even have neuroscience information. What's going on in the brain right. when you are getting conscious of something or paying attention to something or not? That's a huge amount of information that we're not exploiting in machine learning. Well, okay, but so let me let me disagree with you, but in a, a very pleasant way. Yeah, so I'm sitting in uh, uh, Rubik, the Rutgers Brain Imaging Center. I have two scanners. We've scanned about 25,000 brains over probably thousands of studies. <laughs> and a lot of them, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in brain networks and brain connectivity, and we've done a lot of graph theory trying to characterize really smaller systems like things with a thousand ROIs or, or let's call them nodes. And then you can instantiate through structural equation model or something, some weight structures in there and, and do regression. And then you get, you know, essentially something you could actually do some dynamics on. You could run inputs through and watch it change. And we've done stuff like this. And these turn out to be biomarkers, by the way, for things like uh, schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or other things that you can see over time in an archive, you know, kind of the brain falling off a cliff. Now. But th there's something that strikes me about the things you said in, in terms of the cognitive science of this. It's, it, it never seemed to be the case, and in fact, a lot of the neuroscience, the brain imaging data doesn't show this, that the implicit and explicit systems are in close contact in a way that, let's say, from a computer science point of view, you could sort of copy information back and forth, or there'd be no, some sharing. I don't think that's how it is. I, so I don't okay. think that it's like, oh, we have a part of our brain that does system one implicit stuff, and then a part of our brain that does system two explicit stuff. Right. Um, uh, so the uh, much more plausible uh, you know, view in my mind is is, is related to the global workspace theory. So we have this communication bottleneck between different parts of the brain. And the stuff that gets communicated across the brain, that's what we have in current working memory. And you know, it gets updated every half a second or something. Um, so, um, so in a way, it's all like, it's all a neural net and it's all, it's all system one, it's all, but there is this bottleneck you know, and the stuff that goes through that bottleneck the information that gets exchanged in some way through a global coordination which is probably a dynamical system right so the different parts of the brain are kind of coordinating on some interpretation or something okay you'll tell me later you're you're, you're I, li I like I like this but, picture but, but no I like this picture a lot the form. that's the that's the part that we call you know system two or explicit uh, Everything else is happening, you know, below the, 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 the hood. Right. Well, except, so, so the, the part that I, I mean, I agree with all that, and that's very nice. I mean, one of the things that I've sort of uh, learned over the last, you know, almost 20 years of doing brain is that we are talking about what the brain does. It has a, a, a thing called resting state. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's basically kind of a background tonic state that has... Uh, some sort of uh, low frequency structure that then communicates with the it's almost like a, it's almost like a priming system that's waiting for you to decide I'm going to pick up this cup and drink some coffee well all of a sudden the resting state recedes back so this dynamical system moves back and says go ahead <laughs> and parts of it are are picked off to actually implement the picking up the cup and as soon as I'm done with the cup and I'm I fall back into some kind of alpha uh, kind of uh, band, then I'm kind of like uh, tired. <laughs> so, but the thing, the thing that then is a problem here is the explanation part of this. I think, 
uh, humans are really bad at explanation. I mean, one of the reasons professors spend so much time trying to figure out how to explain things is because it's hard to explain things to people who don't know what you're talking about. And explanations, when someone says, you, you got you to gotta realize explanations, you know, not in the academic world, but, you know, sort of in the real world, people say, well, how come that light came on? Well, I don't know, someone must have switched something. <laughs> you know, so not a good explanation, but it's satisfying. So there's a sense, there's a kind of a Herbert Simon sense of, of satisficing here of the, of the sense that we're, you know, we, we like explanations, but generally they're not very useful and they don't do anything. They may right. mainly make you feel better about a situation you don't understand. You know, why why is there light why is it shiny things that are floating through the sky out there that looks like the Aurora Borealis? What is that? And you say, Well, that's like, you know, space clouds. Okay, so not a good oh. explanation, but I'm just saying what parents yeah, tell so, their children. I think you have to be careful about the, the new okay. explanation. The way that Maybe you, the way you seem to uh, refer to it is like in classical AI where we have the explanation. But if you think in probabilistic terms, if you think about ah. the Bayesian posterior Good. over explanations, Good. Okay. then first of all, there's like an, an uncountable number of possible explanations for the stuff we're seeing. Uh, it's just combinatorial. And of course, only one of them, or even not full, like just a piece of it comes to our mind. Yeah. Like the, the piece about somebody, somebody maybe turned off the, the light with a switch. Right. So um, we have this very partial view, and it's only one of many possible explanations. But we have this amazing machinery in our brain that props up, that imagines stuff that, you know, some piece of explanation is going to come up to our consciousness. And you're right. It's, it's a, it, you can think of it like our brain is making a hypothesis. It's not sure. And sometimes we're too sure of our thoughts that's a that's a serious problem for scientists uh, but but really we need to think of the uh, what's going on here is like hypothesis generation which helps because it helps us to connect the dots I mean sometimes it's useless right but sometimes it's super important that's really for me um, one of the strengths of human scientists um, we come up with these explanations and sometimes they're wrong we can do experiments and we see that it doesn't work or somebody tells us well but this is a hole in your reasoning whatever okay because they're not they're not perfect our thinking apparatus is not perfect and it's probabilistic so, so but it's also but it's also arguably it's, it's also arguably income yeah, yeah it's also arguably incomplete I mean that's part of the yes. problem and and it's, 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 explanations it explanations you, you know in the AI sense of having the explanation but that's not what's happening with humans exactly. humans actually just get by most of the time and they get right. by on on this kind of business of uh well hey how'd that happen i don't know man and you know well that's not an explanation a lot of people babbling together okay so that does leave your sort of theoretical pinnings a, a little tricky here and and it brings up another c word by the way uh causality because the one thing that we know biological systems love to do, we love to do this, yes. is we want things to be causal. Why did that happen? Who yes. did that? What's going on? Yeah. What's yeah. That it's that? an obsession. It's, it's an obsession. obsession. And, and it's yeah. very, it's, you know, my cat actually believes in causality up to a point. And then he gives up. He says, that's it. <laughs> Where's the food? You know, it's like, I'm, d I'm done doing your umweg problem. I don't want to, I don't want to solve problems. Just feed me. So, so the, the, there, there's a sense that we're trading off some, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm half serious about this, something that has to do with uh, evolutionary viability or reproductive success. And causality the, the fact that we have to get through the world without being run over by cars and no, 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 uh, and attacked an by I, irs so, agents <laughs> so so wait I, I i disagree a bit here so good i agree we have a very strong inductive bias to look for explanations that are causal right and you know very often they're wrong but sometimes they're right but there's a, there's a, there's another thing it's not just about being wrong or right is that it helps us organize our world model 
so 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 my friend Jan look at us, you know, you know thinks that the biggest thing we miss in machine learning is is a good way to construct a world model. And I think that this causality business is essential. So, and it's connected to the out of distribution problem that I was talking about at the beginning. Right. Right? So when I go from North America to London, the laws of physics didn't change. The uh, way people behave, for the most part, didn't change. <laughs> um, the, you know, and, and there's this, like, this little part of the whole system that changed, and that's just this particular traffic law. And so, in order to be able to generalize out of distribution like this, we need to be able to break down knowledge somehow in our brain into these, what causality researchers call causal mechanisms. So, knowledge about the world in a, in a causal picture is broken down into these relation. These, these causal mechanisms are how cause and effect are related to each other. And of course, you can have multiple causes and so on, but our causal models, our human causal models are very smart. We can't even imagine something where you have a, a, a thousand causes that explain an, an effect. We, it doesn't fit in our mind. We're constrained to have these very, very sparse causal mental explanations, causal graphs. And this is an inductive bias. It's prior, which is often wrong, because you know, the world is more complicated than that. But, but here's the trick. So wait, wait, let me finish. Here's the thing. There are aspects of the world for which it works. Th these assumptions about the world. That, and there are aspects of the world for which it doesn't. So let me try to be more clear. Uh, the um, aspects of the world that come to our consciousness, that we can verbalize over, by construction, by the sort of the constraints of how our brain is designed, are limited to only talking about these very sparse dependencies between entities that have typically some causal relationship to each other. Um, so we can talk about, oh, um, the cat was chasing the squirrel, and then the squirrel, you know, was afraid and, and, and climbed the tree. Okay, so that's the sort of thing our, our um, system two level uh, model of the world is able to handle. But of course, in that scene, that little video, there's a lot more that's going on about how they run and, and you know, like the intuitive physics of what's going on and so on. And that's hard to verbalize because it doesn't fit that assumption. But we still understand it. It's just happening at this implicit or intuitive level. And our brain is able to simultaneously like embrace these two sources of uh, uh, modeling of the world and and you know take the right decisions when especially when our life is at stake. So um, you can make assumptions about the world. But you can mitigate the fact that they're often not correct by having the system one, system two division and say, well, there are things where my assumptions don't apply and I just talk about the abstract stuff that I can verbalize where that these uh, sparsity and causality assumptions make sense. And the rest, sorry guys, it's just going to be under the radar of consciousness. Well, uh, that, that does sound good, but I, I think it's <laughs> there's still this issue of explanation that um, in the in the version you're telling seems um, to be it's be partial explanation. It's never yeah, they, they seem to be like a support vector in a way that, that provides just enough support to get something explained. And that, and the problem, of course, is that when you're explaining things, you're explaining things to another human, typically. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're obsessed with your cat and you're trying to explain, and I've seen people do this, but it's not a good thing. Uh, uh, if you're explaining to another human, then really there's a sense in which you have to do some kind of mental calculus about what they might know. Sometimes talked about as theory of mind, like yeah, and we're what not is it? That. What is it that Yosha knows that I know, and that therefore when he and I, he and I can talk in some shorthand? Whereas if I'm talking to a student who barely knows calculus, I'm going to have a really hard problem describing, you know, the Lot Volterra dynamical system <laughs> to them <laughs> without starting with, you know, foxes um, and and rabbits and them sort of oscillating and eating each other or either starving or being eaten. So the, so there there's a there's a hook here 
and I think you were talking about kind of a minimal amount of explanatory variance or explanatory structure that needs to be there. But then, then why do we need any larger explanation? You know, then other than let's say my specific experience with a car in London or my specific experience making risotto, I don't, I don't need to explain. In fact, I can't explain how to you know, hit a tennis ball or to make risotto right to someone who's yeah. never done it. They're just going to have to do it a couple hundred times. Yeah, absolutely. Because the communication channel between humans is very limited, just like our uh, right. you know, workspace bottleneck. And maybe it's not a coincidence that the two have the same kind of type of limitation. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are these aspects of the world that can fit into that bottleneck. And uh, they have to often, you know, much of a discrete nature and all the symbolic stuff, and you know, it, it goes uh, to a large extent into language. Um, but but we don't need to, as individuals, try to understand the world. Uh, I think there's also benefit. So it's it's not just a tool for communication, and clearly it is, but it's it's also <coughs> a tool for organizing your own understanding of the world, because. So, so here's the thing that bothers me about the current state of the art of deep learning. We have these uh, humongous neural nets that are like one big homogeneous soup of everything connected to everything. The right? blob, yeah, it's the blob. It's the blob, right? yeah. <laughs> And, okay, I'm exaggerating because now the you know, state of the art has a lot of the attention mechanisms, which, by the way, my group yeah. introduced uh, in 2014, 15, and now they're extremely useful, but, but still, but no, wait, we should come back to we should come back to attention in a minute because I think yeah, I'll, that's I'll, it's related to attention because yeah um, in order to break down knowledge into these pieces that are going to be easily recomposable, including pieces that are not verbalizable, um, you need well you need uh, sort of guidance for like what are the right pieces and and. Um, uh, the, uh, this consciousness stuff helps us to do that. It, you don't even need to have a full understanding of how you walk, but you do have a word for it. Right. 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 So, 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 so breaking down knowledge into the right pieces is important for out of this visualization because it allows us to, on the fly with attention, pick the right pieces of knowledge, maybe form a sentence. <coughs> a sentence, of course, is the tip of the iceberg of what you really know. It's just helps to organize your knowledge into the right pieces and select the right ones on the fly. No, I, and, and there, you know, so th this does bring up the linguistic aspect of all this too, because, you know, there, there's a, a, a philosopher here at Rutgers who I uh, had a hate-love relationship with Jerry Fodor, and uh, he, we, I'd often go to a talk and there'd be a pizza and then he'd sit and yell at me about connectionism. Uh, and, and, he do, and he says, you know, there's only one damn good connections out there and that's that Jeff Hinton guy and I said uh-huh uh-huh well he says well uh, maybe you but you know, so but he had this theory about the language of thought and uh, on the face of it it's relevant in that you know he's saying that really our consciousness is is really about the development of language and the way language is organized in the brain and the way that it ties back to our explicit, implicit in interactions. So if we think of the explicit, implicit system as a set of interactions, the question is, is what's being passed back and forth? I think, see, I don't think that you're arguing for hybrid AI here. You're not saying, no. let's, yeah, I, I know that. It's a, it's a, and and uh, it's not like, you know, we're gonna, uh, you know, uh, basically build some kind of theorem prover and then stick deep learning on the side of it and things will things will work out. No, they probably won't work out very well if you do that. Uh, but clearly you, you can um, see behavior that does seem organized in logical ways and has structure to it and um, obviously gets at this implicit, explicit interaction. But there's no I don't I don't see how in your theory that actually can emerge I mean in other words if you're not willing to design this in as an engineering uh, kind of tactic 
how does it emerge out of something that's just exposed to distributions and data and has an architecture unless unless you uh, unless you think the architecture itself is part of obviously the programming language yeah I mean um I think the traditional view in machine in neural nets, we are like in artificial neural nets, uh, and connecting to theories of the brain is you have you have inductive biases that say evolution has put into us, and they come in different places, and they come in the architecture, but they also come in the training objective, like the train the learning world. So the sort of stuff I'm developing right now in my group has both of these the Inductive. So, in other words, the way that they, the kinds of neural nets I'm uh, building up uh, are trained is different from the standard uh, end-to-end backprop on some objective function thing. Um, there's there is an objective. It's just intractable. But you can't. It's, I'm sorry. It's what? There is an objective, but it's it is intractable. It's like intractable. Okay. Yeah, you can't. You can't. So normally in um, in typical supervisor and supervised learning, you you can write an objective function and you just take the derivative of the sector parameters right. and then you update your parameters. Right. So that's a right. standard way of thinking. Sure. But, but actually we have examples where you can't do that. In RL, of course you can write it down, but it's intractable. Right? You would have to sum a rule and so right. on. Right. Uh, if you look at things like uh, most machines, well there is an objective function, but you can't you can't either right. like it's not analytic. So so you know the sort of stuff I'm talking about is, is more of that kind where you you have an objective, but you have to do some sort of sampling. That this is the stuff that comes to your mind that kind of sounds a bit that looks a bit random. Um, in order to be able to get <coughs> the training signal that you can use to train everything. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. So. But. Okay. Again, I. Yeah, I, and, I and, and I agree that it's not as keen separation between. Uh, the explicit and, and the implicit. That's that's not going to work for a number of reasons. So one reason is one of the failures of classical AI is um, a search. Like search gets really hard, and and neural nets are really good at that. So they can do that. They they that's what like um, um, uh, AlphaGo really right. does. Right. So right. You, right. you've got a neural net that tells you well you don't need to actually try a zillion possible. Uh, uh, future games, uh, future uh, trajectories. Just trust me. You know <laughs> this is try, try this. <laughs> try this one because <laughs> it, it has a high probability, right? It, and 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 uh, and I think what you said before in this kind of you know Bayes uh, Bayesian probabilistic approach is that there's things that are likely, and the world will present itself in this sort of modal way. It's not. It's not like a flat space where you have to search everything down to find your keys exactly. they're going to be exactly. like in three places and so those those kind of priors now that's i think something that you said earlier that that this implicit implicit interaction is getting at which i think is crucial to what it is you're trying to do at least from what i can tell and it's sort of where do these little tiny explanations come from now there is um a lot of older research on memory, and I'm sure you're probably aware of it. One uh, very famous Canadian psychologist, Endel Tolvin, who uh, I had known for many, many years, uh, and uh, he, uh, I think he's retired now, uh, uh, but he uh, had come up with, in fact, these different kinds of memory systems. And he and I were on uh, an advisory board, the McDonald Pew Cognitive Neuroscience uh, advisory board for like 10 years and he would just come to me and say hey here's the hippocampus Steve now if you look anterior this is where episodic memories are coming from this is where we say. so he, he he had this very tight view of the way the memory systems are organized and the one thing that people don't talk about in in uh, AI deep learning is his notion of episodic memory and I think that's kind of crucial here because one of the things you find people doing is uh, they don't remember uh, everything. In fact, one of the best things about memory systems in humans is we forget things. Now, right. and that's not actually a bug, that's a feature. We want to basically 
uh, it, 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 let's let's go to the the inverse. Suppose we remembered everything, every episodic lunch you ever had, all the details. Even though you always have lunch with your the same three graduate students every day, you don't remember every one of those lunches specifically. You don't remember the clothing they wear. You don't remember what you wore. You don't remember where you had lunch, or maybe you have lunch at the same place. So what happens is there's an abstraction. And sometimes this is a is kind of a cortical uh, abstraction where you basically see the memory dissolving, and then it, it goes into some cortical region. Okay, it starts out in say parahippocampal gyrus somewhere, you know, near hippocampus, and that you could you could almost consider uh, parahippocampal gyrus as like an MPEG recorder. It's just recording everything. But it's got to be filtered, and so then it gets kind of crystallized. It gets, like, you know, like compressed into a zip file or something in, into cortex, and it says there's a little crystal. And then whenever you go, you know, one of your students says, do you remember the lunch where we were talking about the thing and the thing, and then the person dropped something over there? And all of a sudden, that little crystal will pop back down to the pair of just and unfold itself. And that turns out to be more likely where implicit explicit interactions are occurring is at that episodic level which is usually not represented in this story uh, in general and and frankly you know all we have all we have from a memory point of view in terms of our own individuality and personality are these episodic things sometimes we we generalize them we call you know they become metaphoric it's, you know it's well, like, I think thoughts Thoughts can go into this category. It doesn't have to yeah, be Yeah, absolutely, certain. absolutely. Thought, thought, just sitting around thinking, and th this, in fact, is also being played out because you're unfolding something yeah. that is episodic, and it probably is grounded, to use uh, our friend uh, Steve Harnett's grounding idea. I, don't, I never quite understood exactly. He explained this once to me on an airplane, and I was going... You're not going to talk about this, this meeting, this symbol grounding stuff. He says, yes, it worked out beautifully as far as I can tell, but I still don't quite understand how it happens. But I think it's important that there's some, and, and I wouldn't call it symbol grounding, I call it episodic um, uh, sort of uh, crystallization. There's something about the episodic stuff that turns out to be important and it gets abstracted, and that's the place where we... It can compute, if you will. That's where we're computing yeah. stuff. Yeah. So um, memory, I think, is, uh, is is really important part of the system that machine learning hasn't paid much attention to. I, I agree. There's a little bit of it. For example, in RL, most people use uh, what's called replay buffers, where some snippets of past experience right. can be replayed to train the policy or the right. uh, value function. Um, but it's, it's nothing, um, so for example, one thing that's missing in, in the in, in Ripley buffers um, in, that you see in memory that's connected to the examples you gave is that we have a very selective choice of what we bring back from memory. Um, it has to be relevant in some sense. So it, it's like, one way I think about this is like every memory is competing against all the other memories. That's, and, a, and against that's exact, I think that's right. I think that's right. And and. You know, if it's too weak, like it doesn't have like a big voice, because maybe it was not very emotional or something. Right. Then it never wins the competition. Right. Even if you look for it, but if somebody spells out exactly the right words about this event, then suddenly it has enough support and and it emerges to your consciousness. That's right. Well, there's a good example of that from a a, a kind of a um, a disease uh, argument. If you look at if you look at mental illness, particularly schizophrenia, one of the things that uh, happens, um, and it's just sort of prior to the sort of the first episode, uh, which probably is in teenage years, you see in fact, uh, behaviorally, and, the, and psychiatrists use this as an example all the time, is that there's kind of a deep well, and there's an organization around a very specific episodic thing. It could be it could be a music event. It could be a girlfriend. It could. It, you don't. You don't, by a particular you don't know. Memory. And and what'll happen is whenever that person is stressed, they'll always go back to that well. I see. And they and then they they persevere around that well constantly, and the the kinds. Of course, the more the more you 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 
uh, recall something, the more it's going to. And the more, and the more you, back. that's right. The more you increase the probability of returning as well. So this is, yeah. this is one thing that antipsychotic drug, good antipsychotic drugs do is they basically remove uh, that uh, that big local minima that you're falling into. Uh, maybe by changing something about the dimensionality of the synaptic space. I don't know, but... But it could be, I mean, the fact that it's occurring in disease also suggests that there's something else broken that leads to this... Uh, right. Maybe it's not just a local minimum. Um, so, so one idea I have is that one of the factors in deciding what is going to come to mind is how much information it brings Hmm. about the things you're currently seeing or the things you've seen in the past. Right? That's Thank interesting. That's interesting. So if it doesn't bring any information, for example, it, if you think about things that have happened, that you're, they're already explained. Like they, they, this, Then the propensity of picking those memories or, or those thoughts is just very, very small. It's, it's you know, We're more likely to think about something that we would not have expected, but suddenly becomes probable given the new information we're seeing around us. Right. That's mutual information between like the outside world, the things we're seeing, and our mental constructions. So the things that don't have much mutual information, like random, then um, it probably uh, wouldn't be selected for coming into the global workspace. Yeah, that no, that's th those are some very interesting ideas. I like I like that. Um, uh, it, uh, it it's still there. There's a let's go back to architectures for a minute. Let's let's right. let's get off of psychology and talk layers. The, the things we've been talking about are the sort of discussion cognitive scientists might have about. Oh, I think it's like this. Oh, I think it's like that. Right. But but what I'm trying to do is different. I'm not a cognitive scientist. I, I'm, I'm a machine learning researcher, so I'm trying to design architectures and training frameworks where these sorts of uh, things we're talking about would emerge. Yeah. As a consequence of yeah. 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 Training I, I, I agree. The architecture and so on. Yeah. That was always that was always my belief in the beginning, and and I had done various kinds of studies, and one one of the things I did was when a, a very early autoencoder that. Uh, learned on the brown corpus, and it, I called it parsnip, and it uh, it was you know a single layer hidden, <laughs> and we had sentences, and the sentences they would learn the, but but it had a whole bunch of interesting grammar behavior, and um, the the problem was that I thought, gee, if I had more layers here, maybe it would do something else. <laughs> so I added more layers, and of course. All my derivatives, you know, went to Ohio, and that was the end of that. <laughs> I never learned. Uh, but uh, I mean, that's sort of, I guess, what makes the GPT-3, the transformers, interesting uh, in that they are, you know, learning something more than just a phrase structure similarity yeah. blob. They're clearly doing something more complicated than that. Uh, and and you know part of this may have a lot to do with what we were just talking about in terms of episodic memory. I think that a lot of what is being learned in GPT X's are this this episodic memory, and then what to uh, score as important or not important, possibly based on familiarity and and probability that it's it's being uh, it's being uh, yeah. But, but I don't to. think GPT has anything like episodic memory in the sense of specific memories or specific aspects. I mean. You, well, you wait. How, have, how would you have attention on the input? That's the self attention on, on, on the words. But there's no, there's no like self attention on like inner, like old stuff, old memories or or pieces of knowledge. There's no explicit attention on these things. So I, I I'm not convinced that GPT has these abilities. It's very impressive, but it, I think it's missing all that explicit reasoning layer that needs to be added. On top, and it's also missing the grounding. By the way, right, uh, like right. If you train, it's pretty obvious to me that if you train a, a machine learning system that only sees texts, it's going to miss a whole lot of what the world is about. Like the, all the implicit stuff is going to be missing, and just having the words for things doesn't mean you understand them. Right, and 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 actually, that's an interesting. You know, when the GPT kind of 
framework is uh, inserted in a robot, this starts to become, I think the experimental work there, it starts to become more interesting. But, but I'm not sure I agree. I, I, I think that if GPT-3 is exposed to a lot of Wikipedia, and the Wikipedia has connections about romance languages and uh, different kinds of poetry and so on and so forth, th th those those elements will start to reinforce themselves yes. as, a sem as, the as a semantic network, as a network. What about the knowledge of the world that is uh, condemned to stay implicit, that is not verbal? Yes, system? yes, yes, that's, that's interesting. That's never going to be in the GPTX. Uh, well, uh, I mean, you could certainly yes. train it's it to have explosive. implicit no, knowledge. Unless, unless you, you kind of stick images into it. Uh, no, no, no. I think so. It, uh, you, the most likely application here is, you know, some kind of uh, uh, n uh, home nursing assistant for me in a few years, <laughs> which will come in and, and it'll figure out. Well, Steve needs some soup. Okay, so th th there's there'll be a whole bunch of implicit cues that the entity, the agent, will have to learn just from yes. me being Steve, and it won't really. The, the, the explicit rules it might have gotten from its owners are going to be useless. They may exactly. set up boundaries, you know, don't kill Steve, don't exactly. tip I Steve agree. over. That's exactly my point. That's okay, point. okay, well, okay, I see. I, so we agree, okay, fine, all right. Yeah, uh, but, but, that, but it does, I think it does bring up the issue of this combination of robotics and what is happening with GPT systems because I think that's another phase transition in my mind. There's something going to happen there that's going to be really interesting. <clears throat> I don't know what, but I, I, I bet we'll see a headline. Interesting question. What is, why is it we haven't figured out robotics? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, let me go to one last topic here before we, before we stop. Oh, gosh, this has been so much fun. We just talked almost the time away. But here, here, here's the thing. So I want to go back to things you've been thinking about for a long time and it's the layers it's the depth of these things and what layers are doing i mean it seems to me that you know if i time traveled back and forth from the 80s to here i'd say oh there's dropout there's noise and there's some uh, vanishing derivative uh, mitigation but it's the same thing it's back prop and it's being run just in a big system and it, and with some tweaks it works so What's really different here are the layers, the layers themselves, the, the thousands of layers uh, and you know millions and millions of connections. This turns out to be crucial, and yet we don't have much of a theory about this. It's, it's well, something... So actually, I, I did write some theory papers in the 2000s. I saw those, yes. About why depth could be useful to represent more right. abstract things. Right. And the idea is, although you can represent any function with a single hidden layer, exactly. um, the set of functions, say, it, for the same number of parameters, the, there are functions that you can represent with a deep network that you just can't right. with a shallow one. Right, that's a, be you that's need, a beautiful a result. One. That's a beautiful um, result. And, it, and, yeah. and it's, that's something we can show theoretically, and, and what it means is that Maybe the sort of abstract, you know, high level. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, at the level of conscious processing, but things that are higher up in the food chain here um, might be functions of the, say, the input that would be very difficult to uh, learn with with a, with a shallow network. I mean, you you could if you had a big big enough one, and and it might not generalize as well. So there's a question of generalization. If you another way to put it is. If you have the right architecture, generalization is going to be easier. Right. And our plain one in layer neural nets have very little constraints. When you say, oh, it has to have this sort of deep thing, actually, you're putting constraints. People don't understand that. They think, oh, it's deeper, it has more capacity. But well, it has more parameters, because, right? It has more parameters. When you, when you make it deeper for the same number of weights, you're, you're saying, it's only some kinds of function that I'm going to really like functions that can be represented through the composition of many steps. Um, and similarly, by the way, you know, we carry nets, you know, over if, if you if you have a longer sequence, then you can represent more complex things. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it's, it's all about uh, imposing architectural 
inductive biases that can, if they um, capture something important in the world, yield better generalization. Right. So the the the, the whole idea of sort of bias various trade off and sort of the, the the standard statistical view here is just is not very useful and. It's definitely the case, though, and I, and uh, you may have mentioned this in one of your papers, but it's more recently people have been talking about implicit regularization, and uh, the regularization that's occurring seems to be directly related to the number of layers, and uh, there is some work. Uh, it's it's more empirical. It's not so theoretical. Uh, by a statistician at Berkeley, uh, who I forget his name right now, but I'll remember it later. And what he did was was kind of interesting. He studied, he, he took deep learning networks like um, uh, kind of species that he found in the wild, and he took about 300 of them. And then he took the weights at each layer and he created a correlation matrix for each layer of weights. And then he pulled out the eigenvalue uh, from that correlation matrix and created an eigenvalue distribution. And he then did this at different steps of learning, early in learning, middle learning, and so on, through you know, all the dense nets, VGGs, Z, all these networks, and, you know, Linets and all of them. And he found that there seemed to be like five stages. That is, there seemed to be a kind of a random noise stage where the eigenvalues were just in a huge bulk. And then a stage where they began to kind of, there were covariances that just popped out, or eigenvalues that popped out. And it's like early, it's almost like the deep learning is saying, these are interesting things I'm finding. <laughs> Let's let them go do something for a while. So it's almost like, you know, kind of precursors to feature detectors. I mean, they're just starting to farm, uh, assuming these are all, you know, classifiers. And then, uh, and then there's a a lot of bleed out in the third stage and then there's a flip where the distribution then becomes uh, almost hyperbolic it's it's basically flattening out and all of the information is being pushed out in that tail so that's so there's I know you probably know, you know there's a lot of regularization through the Tikhonov reg regular regularizers and I had published some very early stuff here in the 80s on regularizers and um, and and noise. I've been fascinated by noise and regularizers for a long time, and and I think that has a lot to do with what this fellow was showing. But then all of a sudden you start seeing a rank collapse. So the matrix just and guess what? It learned it. So so there's kind of this kind of slow curation process, and then something happens and bam, it yeah. shoots off. Yeah, and the dynamics and, of learning are very important there. And yeah. There's, of course, connection to all the recent work, uh, both uh, empirical and theoretical, to try to understand why is it that these huge networks that should have, you know should overfit um, right. don't. But my view on this is simply uh, implicit regularization, as you were calling it. Right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the learning dynamics prevents it from overfitting. It stops uh, exploiting the capacity before, uh, you know, as soon as it, it nails the, the training data, then it, it Basically, the weights don't grow anymore, and they don't need to. But don't you think this has something to do with what we were talking about earlier in terms of it's just this implicit, explicit trade-off, even though I agree it's not explicit. I think it's a different meaning of explicit and implicit. Well, except that there's an abstraction that may be going on. I'm just thinking that at some point, as the layers are evolving, um, it's as you say, there's so many constraints, it's not going to basically start fitting every data point it can find. It's basically fitting interesting data points, and then yes. it's it's creating these abstract structures. And yeah, the abstract yeah, structures get to hang around a lot longer. I mean, one of the, uh, uh, as in the single layer uh, hidden unit networks, I mean, one of the problem was this complexity business about loading data. You know, you, you, you've gotten enough capacity, it was good represent, but you couldn't learn anything. The learning was NP complete. I think Judd showed that, so, and others. But, the, but, the, but this is the same kind of thing. All of a sudden, it's easy to learn. <laughs> But there's some trade-off with regard to the representations that are being formed, and I, I still think yeah. that's a very open yeah, question. I don't know. There's so much we need to learn. There's so much we need to learn here, and you know, on that note, I'm going um, to stop. 
unless you wanted to say something and no, add something because okay. this has just been I I feel like even though we haven't uh, met much uh, we've been talking a long time so this is uh, very pleasant to talk to someone who's you know got similar thoughts occasionally maybe that's what explanation is in this context I don't know <laughs> but uh, Yosha thanks again for coming and uh, uh, I hope we can talk again sometime and uh, looking forward to run into you in person instead of in a, in, a, in a small TV <laughs> or a mask yeah, uh, yeah. thanks for the discussion it was uh, very enjoyable alright well you take care bye bye okay bye bye